welcome once again to Horror Babble. Continuing our Artifacts of Horror series, we're thrilled to present the winner of our recent call for submissions, The Rose Colored Glasses by Thomas Kent West. For more information on Mr. West, please see the video description below. And on we go with this most curious of tales. We hope you enjoy it. The Rose-Colored Glasses by Thomas Kent West The Holly Inn was not an inn for madness. It was a dowdy, doily-filled place just three or four hours north of the city and the university, a honeymoon spot like any other, in a dreary, wet town on the Massachusetts coast. And yet, to myself and my new wife, it was as glorious as the Vanderbilt Mansion on Fifth, in good part because we were totally completely alone. That hadn't been the case when we'd booked the spot months before, but upon arrival in the small white house, we came upon a note. Mr. and Mrs. Cannoncraft. My Cecilia smiled at that. I'm afraid some unexpected and dire business has called me away. I must express my sincerest condolences, but I have lost something very dear to me, and must look for it. You are my only expected guests for the week. Feel free to use the premises as you desire, with the exception of the master's suite, which upon no circumstances are you permitted to enter. I hope to see you upon my return, but if not, I have left a bottle of champagne in the bathroom of your suite. Please do forgive me. Congratulations, Monsieur Misk. This, at first, was quite delightful, a whole inn to ourselves on the Massachusetts coast. Cecilia said, I don't care if it rains the whole week. Why, we'll cook for ourselves, too. Now, if it weren't for the cobwebs, this place should be quite lovely. I admired her disposition. She sat to cleaning and to cooking, as thrifty and industrious as she had been when I met her, and I was reminded that I had chosen a fine, sturdy wife, one that would make the most of a meagre poet's salary. She prepared some tea, and I began to work on my manuscript— I relished the time and the solitude to revise and to write, something that the bustle of the city would not afford me, and while I knew that honeymoons were often time reserved for less academic activities, I was quite sure that Cecilia did not mind. We were, of course, both quite nervous, I think. By the time that night came around, I was wishing that Monsieur Misk had been about to break up the silence. I was quite unsure on how to broach the subject and so I simply left the matter unbroached. Cecilia, for all her economic charms, was a simple-looking woman, not to say that I did not find her beautiful, for I certainly did, but it would be dishonest to suggest that she aroused anything carnal in myself or other men. But she was lovely in other ways, and our marriage brought me a certain level of relief, if not perhaps joy. She was a good woman— and I was tempted to think that perhaps my long years of melancholy were over. "'Are you coming to bed, darling?' she said on the first night. She perched herself on one arm, laid out like a mermaid on the antique bed. She wore a simple white nightgown made of embroidered lace. In fact, she looked quite striking, and I found myself feeling suddenly uncomfortable. I told her that I would just need another quarter hour. There was something coming to me, with this— particularly obstinate verse, and if I stopped now it would surely never come. "'Of course, darling,' she said. "'I should be excited to hear it in the morning. I'll make you some tea, so that you don't catch a chill.' She hopped off the bed and pattered along the cold floor, pale white feet moving swift as a dancer. She came up behind me and ran her hands along my shoulders, giving me a lingering kiss on my head. Then she absconded to the kitchen to fetch the tea. I rubbed my eyes, blocking out the light of the oil lamp, suddenly feeling quite tired. Cecilia returned with the tea, bless her soul, and tucked herself into bed without complaint. The night passed on. Around the hour of three in the morning, I began to nod off over my manuscript. The ticking of my pocket watch threatened to lull me into a somnolent hypnosis, as it tick, tick, ticked its way into the deathly quiet of the abandoned inn. It is these hours which my wife has coyly called the poet's hours, that my peculiar madness seems to set in. 
My doctor insists that I sleep. But did Tennyson sleep? Did Poe? No, I think they did not. So to keep myself from sleeping, I took to the house, pacing. Perhaps I should have been sitting and working. But, in truth, my manuscript had become so disgusting to me, that looking at it then would have done me no good. One can only look at drivel for so long and not be taken in by it. I needed to refresh my palate on the quiet dark of the Massachusetts night, to hear the rain and the waves of the infinite ocean. The inn was small, little more than a seaside house, with four rooms, a kitchen, and a small living room and library. The thought of books revolted me. How in that state could I have looked at the works of greater men? I tried to console myself. Did Raphael despair to look upon Leonardo? Did not Virgil mourn at the mighty works of Homer? I remember upon entering the inn the presence of a small balcony, a widow's walk, by the local speech, off the master's suite. I thought that perhaps the fresh air would invigorate my mind enough to at least finish that cursed verse which had so vexed me for the night. It was late, and I hardly remembered M. Misk's warning about the master suite, or perhaps I was too tired to care. The door, at the far end of the long second-story hall, was of a black wood that I did not recognize. The suite would be at the seaward point of the inn, facing the vast black ocean beyond. I could almost feel it churning behind that door. I opened it by the cold iron knob, and pressed the tip of my oil lamp into the inky darkness of the master's suite. It was an unassuming room, and I paid little mind to it. The furnishings were even more antique than the rest of the inn, with a four-post bed made of the same queer black wood. The only truly strange thing about the room were the preponderance of Victorian dolls. Someone had stacked them lovingly around the room, staring towards the centre. In the burning half-light of the lantern, their child's faces looked like porcelain masks floating in the inky ether. I paid little mind. It was, after all, a discount inn, and a certain amount of uncanny decorations were expected. Likely the inn used to be a house owned by a spinster, perhaps Monsieur Misk's own mother, and these had been her rooms. I hurried to the balcony at the seaward side of the room, and flung open the shutter doors. Immediately the refreshing wave of sea air struck me, cool and saline, and ripe with life. The sky was pocked with stars that hid beneath roiling grey storm clouds. In the distance, a true storm approached. Thunder growled within it, like some slumbering chthonic god. Lightning cracked just before me, and I was thrust back. Strangely, something caught my eye. It glinted, reflecting the lightning from where it was hiding, tucked away beneath the nightstand. I often think of how unlikely this string of events must seem—the lightning, myself falling, the brief shine of the object. But then, looking back, it doesn't seem unlikely at all. It seemed, in many ways, planned or predestined, from the moment of arrival at the inn, to my fateful intrusion into the master's suite. Stupidly, like a crow drawn to shining objects, I crossed the room and got down on my hands and knees to reach beneath the dresser. I fished around, finding nothing but dust, until my hand fell on something small and cold. I retrieved the pair of glasses quickly, understanding that the light from the storm must have revealed their location. They were old, with a wireframe of tarnished brass. They would have been utterly normal, if not for their position of honour, and the queer colour of their lenses. The glass was a peculiar shade of rose. This, perhaps, is just what I need, I thought. Perhaps my eyes were simply fatigued from all the reading. I pocketed the spectacles, and made up my mind to return them the following morning, then left the room and the dolls to their silence. I became aware, as I left, of a budding foul smell in the room, and wondered briefly if the dolls had taken to rot. I returned to my manuscript, settling into the armchair reader in the library downstairs. I set the lantern close to me, and donned the rose-coloured glasses, hoping that the light and the focused lenses would renew my energy. And lo, it did. I scanned the pages I had written and revised that night, once so base and revolting, that I could not deem to look at them. Now—well, now they were quite good. 
In fact, they were some of my best work, I thought. The language was so pure, so refined. I had never seen it with such clarity. The barren soil, the gallows wrought. Yes, yes, that was quite good. But what about— And our final mountain tops, we speak, we glow, we worry not. Why, yes, how could it have been that I never noticed? This manuscript was a work of my truest self. I sat enraptured by myself, by the lines, by the shape and sound of it, even the touch and smell of the crinkled, overwrought pages. A surreal joy bloomed inside me, a joy that I had not felt in years. Even the inn, which in the rains had seemed secluded and oppressive, now took on an antique charm that I had failed to notice. The worn white walls, bathed in the soft pink of the strange glasses, exuded a joyous charm. Yes, the manuscript, the poetry, the inn, all the pieces of my life were coming together. It was clear that once the manuscript was published, the worries and sorrows and constant melancholy that I had endured in my undergraduate years would wash away, wash away like shadows in the light of a new and rapturous day. Darling? A high and sweet voice came from the stairs. Cecilia stood there in her nightgown, looking for all the world like a half-sleeping goddess. She rubbed her eyes, those brown eyes like a clever fox's, her hands and fingers and wrists so delicate, so thin like hummingbird bones. How could I have never noticed such a beauty, all dressed in rose? Darling, you were yelling. Are you quite all right? I ran to her, taking the steps two at a time, until my strong hands were wrapped around the small of her back. I told her in no small words that she had made me, quite simply, the happiest man on earth, and it had taken this inn, and the solitude of it, of she and I, for me to see that I had been gifted by the God the greatest treasure of my life. She looked almost frightened for a moment, no doubt used to my usual melancholy, but I pulled her in tightly, and was sure, once and for all, that all the clouds had lifted from my life. The day soared as if by the sheer power of my joy the storm lifted, shattering into bits, and sunlight baked the wet shore. We spent mornings on the beach in divine solitude. There was not another inn or town or fisherman's shack in sight of us, and I wore nothing but my suspenders, and she wore that nightgown, that simple, splendid nightgown, that I begged her to wear day and night. "'Don't flatter me now, darling. It's a rag,' she'd say but she'd smile as I'd run my hands across it. Cecilia lost in the rapture of being desired simply for being herself. I could not get enough of her, of the sun, the sand, the moon, and the stars, all celestial bodies equal in their might. We feasted on each other, and at night after she had cooked we would sweep off to bed, but never sleep, for there was too much joy in the world for that. It was only midway through the week that she commented on my glasses, "'What a strange colour," she said, lying next to me in bed. "'But lovely, like a stained-glass rose. Will you ever take them off?' I smiled. "'Why should I? With the glasses on, the world was pink and prim, and nothing at all could go wrong. I told her so, that the glasses made me happy.' "'Truly? Well, I wonder why. Must be some effect of the light, surely, that staves off the melancholy. Could I try them on, my love?' For the first time in days— I frowned. But then I righted myself. Why shouldn't she? Why, everyone should have the chance to see the world as I saw it through the rose-coloured glasses. Yes, I was quite sure that the thing I wanted most in the world was to share this feeling with the woman I loved. I took them off. The pink-hued world vanished, reduced itself to grey. I blinked thrice, staring at Cecilia. I smiled. She was as lovely as ever. Her eyes widened beneath the pink glass of the spectacles. Why, yes, I do see it. The world just seems brighter somehow, don't you think? She looked around the room, to the grey sunlight coming from the window, to the grey sheets at her grey hands. She smiled at me then, and bit her lip, running her fingers along my chest. Energy seemed to hum out of her. Suddenly, she threw the sheets from us, and leapt onto the floorboards. Come on now, let's dance, darling, she said. She flitted around the room, 
the rose-colored glasses seemingly the only color in the gray. She looked a little ridiculous. She did not have the slender figure of a dancer, but the stout, strong body of a farmer's daughter. I laughed, and said there was no place to go dancing, in a town this small. Oh, but please, please, can't we go dancing? Oh, darling, this is the happiest I've been in ages. Can't you see? Can't you see it too? She looked up at me with those intoxicating rose eyes, and I obliged. There was a small dance hall in town, contrary to my assessment. A few musicians on folk instruments, small guitars and a standing piano, played to a crowd of townspeople. We must have looked ridiculous in our city clothes, myself in a high-collared shirt and suit, and dear Cecilia in a yellow dress. But the other dancers failed to mind. In fact, they adored Cecilia, and by the time the night was through and I was good and drunk, I was sure she had danced with every bumpkin in the place. I danced for as long as I could, but I found that I was not in the mood. The beer was thin and bitter, and the low, ancient ceiling left me feeling claustrophobic. Each and every fisherman smelled more of rotting pickerel than the last, and when Cecilia came back to my corner, red-faced and panting, to beg me to dance, she reeked of the other men of the bar, musk and thin beer and spoiled fish. I swatted her hand from me, and grabbed her by the soft flesh of her arm. It was time that we left, I thought and I dragged her away as she waved to her admirers. The rest of the days carried on much the same, only now it was she who could see the unnatural beauty of our little world, and I grew more bitter by the day. Why had I deemed her worthy to share my glasses? Why had I made myself low enough to marry such a wayward, careless thing? I poured myself into my work, only to find it as disgusting as ever. I let myself grow more and more sullen, until, in a fury, I tore my manuscript into thin sheets and threw them about the bedroom. Cecilia only laughed, dancing in the rain of my life's work like it was confetti. Then, realizing what I had done, I begged her on my knees to please, please return to me my glasses. Cecilia smiled. Well, why didn't you say so, darling? It matters not at all to me. Here she said, handing me the spectacles. Now quit pouting and dance, darling boy, dance! I stared into those wide rose eyes that she had so carelessly given me like I held the heart of Christ himself. I fit them onto my countenance with shaking, hungry hands, and gasped, for all the colour in the world had been returned to me, and at the centre of it, glowing like a virgin queen, was Cecilia, Cecilia! each syllable sweeter than the last. I swept myself to my feet, laughing and kicking aside the ruined scraps of my manuscript. We waltzed on the ashes of my poetry, sweeping along to our own lonely private music, in that empty nowhere in. We did not go home. The term of our stay passed, and Monsieur Misk did not return. We still had the inn to ourselves, and why should we return? Surely my classes could resume without me, and anyone who could see what we could see, the beauty of our little world at the inn, would surely understand that a few more days in paradise were worth any cost. But these days passed in waves of joy and disillusion, as the glasses passed between our trembling hands. As soon as one of us grew irritable, we merely exchanged the rose-coloured glasses for a while. The wearer was always overjoyed to share them, because what good is the beauty of the world if it cannot be shared? And yet we ceased to go out into town, not wanting to permit anyone into our secret world, lest they grow envious of it. What a gift! We both repeated and repeated and repeated, to find something that could make us happy all the time. Perhaps another week had passed. I couldn't say for sure. I rarely thought of school, or of Monsieur Misk and instead began toying with some new poetry, whenever I had the blessing of the rose-coloured glasses. It far outstripped my old works, which still lay shredded on the floor, never cleaned. I sat hunched over the desk in the far corner of the bedroom, furiously scribbling. I smiled brightly, and brushed some dust from the spectacles. The sun was bright, the room as lovely as ever. 
The only thing in the world that could have bothered me was the patter-patter of Cecilia pacing behind me. These were the only sounds. The scribble of the pen, the sound of slight rain, and the gentle patter of my beloved, which sounded like thunder, like the ticking of a clock. Darling? Cecilia asked. Darling, do you think I could have the glasses now? I ignored her. The poem was almost complete. Well, it's been almost a full day now, and you see, I'm feeling rather blue, feeling a bit like I don't fit in my own skin, you know? Surely you know how that feels? You and your melancholy. I told her most assuredly that I would be more than happy to share, but this poem, well, it simply required a lot of focus, a way of seeing the world. She wrest the glasses from my face without warning, and placed them on her own. There was a queer madness in her eyes, as she absconded to her own corner of the room, but I hardly noticed. The room itself consumed my attention. Everywhere— Half-eaten meals and moulding wine-glasses lay strewn and shattered. The walls had acquired a thick layer of grime from my pipe. Cecilia sat in the thick of it, smiling. Her white nightgown, which I had loved so dearly, was stained and smeared with all manner of greases and malodorous stains. I looked down at the manuscript in my hands, the poetry— which just moments ago consumed my soul with a passion the likes of which I had not felt since I was a child. It read, Joy, joy, the gay meadow waltz, I see the stars, I see the moon, I see my Cecilia in the hue of our rose-coloured glasses. It stopped. I stared at each word on the page, what amounted to hours of work. How could I, in my joy, have seen this as poetry? And how could I have felt so deeply the unbridled excitement that I felt it awaken in me? How much, if any of it, could be real joy, if she and I felt happy all the time? I committed myself then and there to never don the rose-coloured glasses again. I wish that I could have been so strong. The days passed, perhaps another week, and the letters began to arrive. They were not from Monsieur Misk, who surely should have returned by now— but from my employers at the university, concerned for my safety, and I rate at my absence. Cecilia's father, a wealthy merchant, wrote ceaselessly for the return of his daughter, but my Cecilia was still dancing, dancing, and she was quite sure that everyone out in the grey world could wait. Each time a letter came, she simply insisted that I take the rose-coloured glasses and see the issue in a more positive light. It worked each and every time. It was only the smell that bothered me. Whether I was wearing the glasses or not, the smell of our forgotten meals and spilt wine remained sharp and unyielding. When I had my mind about me and Cecilia wore the glasses, I made an effort to clean, although I felt myself growing more and more drained when the world was grey and not pink. Days passed, and the smell grew stronger. Once, a man came to knock on our door, but by then everything was locked and all the windows shuttered. We'd flipped the small sign on the front door to closed, to ward off any other guests or any men come to retrieve Cecilia. A letter arrived, indicating that my employment at the university had been terminated for the foreseeable future, but I left it with the others, consumed in my search for the smell. It tickled at my nostrils tugged at some part of my brain that slept while I wore my glasses, that part reserved for horror and tragedy. Finally, I decided to look in the one place that I had not dared, the master suite, of which Monsieur Misk specifically warned us not to enter, a room in which I discovered the rose-coloured glasses. I returned to the door made of that queer black wood that I could not name. A storm raged outside the windows— and I could hear Cecilia dancing downstairs, humming along to some invented tune. She'd been at it for hours, but I could not shake the smell, and when I did not wear the glasses it consumed my every thought. The master suite was not locked, and I noted that if Monsieur Miss had truly wanted to keep us out, shouldn't he have simply locked the room? The door was heavy, and I shouldered into it. A waft of putrid air exhaled from the room— it carried with it the stench of death. 
There was the room as I remembered it, with its four-post bed and widow's walk, with its staring, ugly dolls. But I was certain that the smell that plagued me was coming from here, and I spied a second door leading to a posterior chamber. The second room of the suite was a dark, overgrown thing, with heaps of velvet curtains on the walls that only served to capture the smell. There was a large, four-post bed made of the same strange black wood, and set of bay windows on the far wall, facing the roiling black sea. There was no other adornment, save for a lone man, hanging from a rope from the ceiling. His countenance was bloated, with rot, purple, and white and oozing, but it could not be mistaken for anyone, other than Monsieur Misk. My legs lost their strength, and I fell to the wall for support. It was like all the air had gone out of me, and I recognized that I was undergoing a severe panic. When I tried to breathe, the smell of the rotting innkeeper infected me, so that I wished to scream it out of me. From my position on the floor, I could see something carved crudely into the ceiling just above the swinging body. Where are my glasses? Cecilia didn't seem to mind. He's in a better place now, darling, she said, dancing around the body. I would hate for anyone to have to suffer through such a joyless life. My nerves had gotten the better of me, and Cecilia had to carry me back into our bedroom under one arm. Monsieur Misk's final words, the words of the note he left us, repeated over and over again in my mind, a black tide. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Cecilia set me on the bed, my hands slightly shaking, and wrapped me presently in the dirty sheets. Then she set the rose-colored glasses onto my eyes, and bid me go to sleep. I dreamed, sweet dreams. When I awoke, it was too dark to see. I had the feeling of having had too much to drink the night before, and my head pounded. The smell still lingered beneath the heavy, dusty air, and I felt as though it crept from underneath mine own skin. I shambled over to the window, still in my wrinkled clothes of the day before, and threw the curtains back. Midday sun exploded into the room, and burned my eyes, which I shielded, only to recognize that my eyes were bare. Where had the glasses gone? Cecilia was not in the bed, nor could I hear her dancing downstairs. I shambled out of the bedroom, over moulding plates and old laundry. I found her discarded white nightgown on the stairs, and the front door left ajar. Sunlight and spring air wafted through, temporarily relieving the stuffy smell of death that pervaded the lower apartments. I called her name. No one answered. I called again, and it became clear that I was alone in the house, with the exception of the remains of Monsieur Misk. I stumbled into the yard, across the porch and down the steps. I called her name over and over. Cecilia! Cecilia! A haggard beggar calling for bread. What a sight I must have made, in unwashed clothes and unshaven, crawling out of our dungeon house into the sunlight. That is when I saw her. She sat at the bus stop just before the inn, dressed in her finest dress and broad-rimmed hat, trim with a red bow. Her hands were folded in her lap, and two packed suitcases sat at her side. I saw that she was wearing the rose-colored glasses, and fury like I'd never known swelled inside me. I shuffled to her, my body weakened from the weeks indoors with hardly any food or sunlight. She heard my coming and stood, reaching for her bags. "'You witch!' I said. "'You plan to leave me?' She only smiled. "'Well, of course, darling, of course. But not for too long. There's simply too much to see. Can't you see that?' All this silliness over the spectacles has made your melancholy even worse, and it simply won't do to have us around. It's for your sake, darling, for you. Can't you see? Can't you see that everything is going to be all right? She looked at me, smiling, her eyes bright behind the cursed glasses. I wanted to scream. How could everything be all right? I'd lost my job, I'd lost everything, and there was a dead man in the upstairs of the inn. 
I could feel the matter of my brain as though someone were driving a hot lance behind my right eye. Give me the glasses, I said, as slow and cold as I could possibly manage. She shook her head. Relax, darling, please. You're frightening me. I repeated myself, and again she refused. She took a step backwards, towards the road. I do not know exactly when I noticed the bus turn the corner onto the road, nor could I necessarily blame it on the rose-coloured glasses, but I decided to push my dear Cecilia in front of it, because of course I did not possess them at the time. But I do very clearly remember the moments afterwards, Cecilia lying mangled on the pavement, the driver of the bus rushing to her, cradling her half-crushed head in his hands, and myself rushing towards the opposite side of the road and snatching up the rose-coloured glasses, inspecting them eagerly for cracks, not bothering to wipe off the spray of blood that splattered the pink lenses before placing them gingerly over my eyes. And then, of course, everything was well. Cecilia passed peacefully, or so I was told. I did not bother to deny the testimony of the bus driver, or of the passengers, and for what reason would I? Everything is well where I am, here in the prison. I have all I need. In fact, I do believe that life is a most beautiful thing. And they let me keep my glasses.'